Why did John Wesley see scriptural holiness as a privilege and a blessing? We begin to answer these questions in this Standing with Wesley. Welcome to this episode of Standing with Wesley. With this episode, we begin a new series of studies on scriptural holiness, a central teaching of scripture about which, unfortunately, there are many misconceptions and even fear. Some people believe that holiness is going to make their lives miserable, while other people believe that holiness will turn them into religious fanatics so that, as the saying goes, they're so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. In truth, holiness, properly understood, is that which fulfills the plan of God for each one of us, for me and for you, and gives us the most fulfilling walk with God and life of service to our Lord. So I hope you'll stay with us as I seek to demystify this subject for you through the words of John Wesley and the teachings of Scripture, so that you can, with John Wesley, see scriptural holiness as a privilege and a blessing, not a threat. We begin today's episode with a reading from Peter's first letter. Peter wrote, Prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you with the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. An important clue to how John Wesley saw holiness is found in his explanatory notes upon the New Testament, in which he used the word happy rather than blessed in his translation of the Beatitudes. In his explanatory notes upon the New Testament, John Wesley wrote concerning Matthew 5, 3, Happy are the poor. In the following discourse, there is a sweet invitation to true holiness and happiness, verses 3 to 12. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven, the present inward kingdom, righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, as well as the eternal kingdom, if they endure to the end, Luke 6, 20. And regarding Luke 6.20, he wrote, In the following verses, our Lord, in the audience of his newly chosen disciples and of the multitude, repeats, standing on the plain, many remarkable passages of the sermon he had before delivered, sitting on the mount. He here again pronounces the poor and the hungry, the mourners and the persecuted happy, and represents as miserable those who are rich and full and joyous and applauded because generally prosperity is a sweet poison and affliction a healing though bitter medicine. Not everyone would agree with John Wesley's translation of the Beatitudes, but what we have here is a situation in which it's often difficult to translate a word into another language and preserve all of its meaning. John Wesley looked at the underlying Greek word makarios and saw that it has an inherent meaning of happiness that he wanted to communicate to the readers of the Beatitudes. And in this, John Wesley is not alone. Keep in mind that the word John Wesley translated happy is the Greek word makarios. In the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, Friedrich Hauck wrote, The special feature of the group makarios, makaridzain, makarismas in the New Testament is that it refers overwhelmingly to the distinctive religious joy which accrues to man from his share in the salvation of the kingdom of God. Again, keep in mind that the underlying Greek word we're discussing is makarios. In his theological lexicon of the New Testament, Cecil Speak wrote, The essence of the gospel ethic is summed up in the axiom, Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Jesus is making an appeal to happiness. 
It is impossible to insist too strongly on the meaning of this Macarius repeated ten times in Matthew, and intensified by the imperatives, Rejoice and be glad, Kairite kai agliaste, for your reward is great in heaven. This is much more than contentment. It is an interior joy that becomes external, elation translated into shouts, songs, acclamations. The explanation is that God will be the source of this beatitude. It was John Wesley's insight that God's most outstanding characteristic is love. Therefore, the holiness of God, when referring to his whole character, must not be viewed simply as his justice, righteousness, and judgments, but must include his mercy and his care as well. And because the happiness of holiness is rooted in God who desires to bless us for eternity, it is not, like worldly happiness, dependent upon our outward conditions. Without getting into the details of the interpretation of each of the Beatitudes, it is apparent from them, from Romans 8, and from Hebrews 10.32 through chapter 11 into the first two verses of chapter 12, that the happiness that is described is not dependent upon outward circumstances, but upon God and his love and fellowship with those who love him. This is also why Christian thanksgiving is not dependent upon circumstances, but upon the reality, character, and promises of the living God. Notice that in all of the scripture passages given, there is a look beyond current circumstances to the time when Jesus returns and is Lord over all, a time when the troubles of this world are past. Jesus said, In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Writing in the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, Heinrich Schleier wrote, Under the promise of Christ, which orients faith to hope, suffering calls for patience. In patience, the hope is sustained which sees the invisible rather than the visible, so that the present tribulation which consumes man is reduced to a small affliction for a brief period as compared with the coming glory as seen in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 and following. And so the first thing we notice about scriptural holiness is that it means happiness rooted in the reality, love, and promises of God. The second thing we should notice is that scriptural holiness is a benefit of the atonement of Jesus Christ at Calvary. David Ackerman wrote in the Wesleyan Theological Journal, Jesus' death opened a new way of relationship with the Holy God by which we can approach God as people made holy inwardly by a change of disposition through the cleansing of our conscience. What the Old Testament longed for, expressed poignantly through the prophet Jeremiah, becomes a reality for those who look to Jesus for their help. Jesus makes it possible for us to reach a perfection that begins with an inner change and works out in faith and obedience and ever-increasing victory over sin. Holiness, as expressed in Hebrews, is not an abstract hope, but a livable reality through Jesus, the great high priest. The author of Hebrews wrote, We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat, for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. In his commentary on Hebrews, Gareth Cockrell wrote, Outside the city gate was the equivalent in Jesus' day of outside the camp in the Old Testament. It is there that he, Jesus, offered his sacrifice to make the people holy through his own blood. John Wesley wrote, By justification we are saved from the guilt of sin and restored to the favor of God. By sanctification we are saved from the power and root of sin and restored to the image of God. John Wesley wrote, But what is it to be justified? What is justification? It is not the being made actually just and righteous. This is sanctification 
which is, indeed, in some degree, the immediate fruit of justification, but nevertheless is a distinct gift of God and of a totally different nature. The one implies what God does for us through his Son, the other what he works in us by his Spirit. Thomas Oden clarifies Wesley's position on justification. Wesley's letters confirm that justification is the gracious act of God by which he grants full pardon of all guilt and complete release from the penalty of sins committed so that penitent sinners are accepted as righteous. Pardon and acceptance, Wesley wrote, though they may be distinguished, may not be divided. All who believe in Jesus Christ and receive him as Lord and Savior are saved. Sincerity of intention toward God is a necessary but not sufficient condition for salvation. The sole sufficient condition for justification is clear, penitent faith. Thus, repent and believe. Repentance consists of conviction of sin and faith in the conviction that God showed his love by dying for me, the premise of all holiness and good works. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul wrote, Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In his explanatory notes upon the New Testament, John Wesley commented, namely, the sum of which is, God, the whole Godhead, but more eminently God the Father, was in Christ reconciling the world, which was before at enmity with God, to himself. So taking away that enmity, which could no otherwise be removed than by the blood of the Son of God, he made him a sin offering who knew no sin, a commendation peculiar to Christ, for us, who knew no righteousness, who were inwardly and outwardly nothing but sin, who must have been consumed by the divine justice had not this atonement been made for our sins, that we might be made the righteousness of God through him, might through him be invested with that righteousness first imputed to us then implanted in us, which is in every sense the righteousness of God. John Wesley recognized from the scriptures that the atonement enables God's plan to sanctify those who turn to him in repentance and faith. And this sanctification consists of a real work within, not just for those reconciled to God. The word saints appears often in our Bible to identify Christians, those in personal fellowship with Jesus Christ. The word translated saints in our English Bible literally means holy ones in the original Greek text. A saint is someone who is sanctified. To sanctify is to make holy in Greek, hagiadzo. To be made holy is to become a holy one in Greek, Hagias. And of course the plural form is used in the New Testament frequently to indicate Christians, saints, or holy ones. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 2 to 3, we have an example of the word sanctified used with the word saints. And it's a place where the New American Standard Bible has an alternate reading of holy ones for saints. Paul wrote, To the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, holy ones by calling, with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So what does it mean to be made holy in the manner in which the scriptures speak of this? In the scriptures, to be holy is to be separated to God from the world transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, a child of God, therefore a member of the household of God, a member of the body of Christ, 
and a member of the Church of Jesus Christ. Paul wrote to the Colossians, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Thomas Oden wrote, The church is inadequately defined as a voluntary association of believers. Rather, believers emerge only as members of the body, viewed as an organism, formed from within, Christ himself being the living center indwelt by the Spirit, whose members are expressions of his living body, each one being formed and imprinted by his person. The church is not of human devising. It does not belong to us. This family does not exist because people adopt each other, but because they are adopted by God into the family of God. He then cites Romans 8.23 and Ephesians 1.5. To be holy is also to be purified, purified from both the guilt and the effects of sin. Some parts of this work are instantaneous, and some parts are gradual. In 1 John 1, 9, John wrote, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. To be holy is also to be made Christ-like. There is a restoration of the full image of God and a conformity to the character of Jesus Christ so we live as he lived. And we take a redemptive view of the world in every way possible, we seek to bring people into reconciliation with God through Jesus Christ. This process also has both instantaneous and gradual aspects. Paul wrote to the Romans, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son. Now it's important to notice in this passage that this is not a predestination to salvation. Those he foreknew would be his in the church of Jesus Christ. Those who were his children he predestined to be conformed to the image, the moral character of Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, Paul wrote, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. As we consider these three aspects of what it means to be holy, it's important to remember that when holiness is mentioned in the scriptures, it isn't always referring to all three, or at least not with the same emphasis upon each one. Sometimes it's speaking primarily of only one aspect or two. Remembering this helps us to make the best sense of certain passages of scripture. Of course, the full teaching of scripture and many passages have all three in view, and that is how we should understand God's plan for us. John Wesley wrote, By the saints I understand those who are holy or righteous in the judgment of God himself, those who are endued with a faith that purifies the heart, that produces a good conscience, those who are grafted into the good olive tree, the spiritual invisible church, those who are branches of the true vine, of whom Christ says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. Those who so effectually know Christ as by that knowledge to have escaped the pollutions of the world. Those who see the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, and who have been made partakers of the Holy Ghost, of the witness and the fruits of the Spirit. Those who live by faith in the Son of God, those who are sanctified by the blood of the covenant, those to whom all or any of these characters belong, I mean by the term saints. If you're a Christian, you may never have thought of yourself as a holy one, but that's how the scriptures describe you, 
and it means that you are seen by God as His, and He's working out His plan in and through your life, a great privilege that you have now and in the age to come. If you are not a Christian, then I invite you and encourage you to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, invite Him to come into your life, commit yourself to follow Him, and you too can have the experience of inner joy that comes from being a child of God. Many historical writings provide invaluable guidance for our daily walk with God, but they can't speak to issues that arose after they were written or focus on areas that require special emphasis in a later era. I wrote Walking with the Full Assurance of Understanding to present the timeless truths of biblical Christianity together with contemporary information to help you live the Christian faith in today's world. Read it through for information and insights then keep it for reference for your own future study. Available in softcover and in hardcover from booksellers worldwide as a standard ebook from ChristianBook.com, Kindle version from Amazon, and Nook version from Barnes & Noble, there's a convenient version for everyone who wants the confidence of an informed walk with God. There's also a book trailer on this channel for those who are interested. There's more to discover so we hope you'll join us next time as we continue to explore John Wesley's scriptural holiness. Mm -hmm.